Uh, the topic for today is to talk about basic analytical tools, which includes the analytical balance and analytical glassware. The electronic balance is one of the most common pieces of equipment that you'll use, and it's important to understand how it works. You have the sample pan, which is in the center right here, and it's levitated in space using an electromagnet. And that's above a permanent magnet, so there's an interaction between these two magnets. You'll never see this, but on the inside, there's a light, and the light reaches a photodiode, which is a detector. And the amount of light seen indicates the pan position, how high or low it is, and therefore how much mass there is. If you put a mass on the pan, something that you're weighing, it's going to change the amount of light that's detected. And then the balance is going to need to counterbalance that by increasing the amount of current to the electromagnet. And that'll be increased until you get the light back to the same position that had been before. And the amount of current required is going to be proportional to the mass. To use it properly, you have to make sure the balance is clean, um, so you don't have any particulate matter getting in the way. It has to be level. Most balances are going to have a level on there. Um, this one is shown here, and these are usually a bubble level. So it's a circle, and then inside the circle is a bubble, and you want that bubble to be in the center. So that's good. If you had the bubble level and your bubble was off to the side, that would be bad. Okay. You can adjust the feet. You can see that these front feet here, I dropped my pen. You can see the front feet here have got uh, kind of a nubbin on them so you can rotate them. So make sure it's level. Also, you want to keep it away from vibrations. Um, and you want to handle your sample using tongs or tissues, gloves. Um, these balances are so sensitive that they can weigh the fingerprint from you handling your sample. Also, if you have a volatile sample, you want to cover it up so it's not evaporating away. You want to close those doors to get rid of drafts, and you want to use room temperature samples. If you have a warm sample, then what we do know about heat is that if you have your sample on there, heat is going to cause an updraft. And that's going to lift your sample a little bit and cause it to weigh less. If you have a cold sample, you're going to get a downdraft, and that's going to make your sample weigh just that little bit more. Um, last thing, and that's not written on here, so I'll write it on here right now, is that you also want to avoid static. Um, sometimes you're using a sample, and this will happen a lot in the winter, and your mass will just drift. And that can be because you've got static electricity in your sample, and because this is an electromagnet, the static electricity can cause some problems. So what do you do if your sample absorbs water? Absorbing water from, say, the atmosphere is going to be bad when you're weighing it. First of all, you should realize this is called hygroscopic, so you can determine if a material is hygroscopic by seeing that keyword. Um, if your sample is already wet, you can dry it in a lab oven, which is shown there. Just be careful not to set the temperature too high. Your sample might decompose, so you might have to do a little research on that. After you've put it in the oven, you need to let it cool down on a desiccator because, as I mentioned before, if it's still hot when you weigh it, you're going to have the wrong mass. And then because it's going to absorb water while you're weighing it, um, given that there's always some moisture in the atmosphere and your balance is probably in the atmosphere, um, you're going to weigh your sample by difference. And one of the ways to do this is to use a weighing bottle, and that's shown up here on the top right. It's got a cool little lid right there that'll come off. Um, and so you can put your sample in this capped weighing bottle, weigh it, take some out, weigh it again, and then the mass dispensed is taken by the simple subtraction of the two. Another factor about weighing bottles is that um, they're usually glass like that and can be put into the drying oven without much problem. I mentioned the desiccator. It's used in that last sequence to keep things dry while they're cooling down. Just desiccators can be used at any point to cool, or uh, can be used at any point to dry things off. Um, it's a chamber, and the chamber has a little grid on which your samples can sit. And so imagine you've got a cute little beaker up here, um, better chemist than an artist. And so underneath that, you're going to put a desiccant um, or a drying agent. And there are a bunch of drying agents on the table here. Um, dryer right is one of the most common. It's got a little color indicator on it that tells you when it's wet and dry. Um, but if you need things to be even drier than that, there are other options. So that's weighing and drying. Um, you're going to use a lot of glassware, and it's helpful to understand some of the marks on the glassware. A lot of the analytical glassware is labeled with either TD, which means to deliver, 
or TC, which means to contain. And you can see that on both this little cross section of a pipette, where we've got the TD right there, and on this volumetric flask where it says TC for to contain. So to deliver and to contain. The other thing to realize is that these are usually at a set temperature. They're usually at, say, 20 Celsius. Um, and that also the accuracy of your glassware is on there. So this particular 100 ml flask is plus or minus 0.3 milliliters. When I talk about analytical glassware and I refer to things that have really good accuracy, it's usually what you want to use if you need a precise and correct volume. Um, I'm talking about the volumetric flasks, which are here, about your burette, which is used to, again, deliver. So great thing about volumetric flasks is it's your best way to contain a known volume. Um, both burettes and pipettes are used for delivering good volumes. Things that are inaccurate, um, you're not so sure what you're getting there, are the graduated cylinder. Now, that's not bad. It's about 1% accuracy. Um, so I'm going to give him kind of a little meh face, um, but please, not in an analytical lab are you going to be trying to get an actual volume off of a beaker or an Erlenmeyer flask. They're great to hold things, but you're going to get known volumes from other pieces of glassware. So that volumetric flask, you're going to use it a lot because it is our two-contain um, piece of glassware. It has a well-known total volume, and it's usually used in making stock samples or dilutions where you need to know that total volume, molarity, moles per liter. How are you going to know you have a liter? Volumetric flask, voila. Um, so you are usually making a solution. You need to weigh the solid that you're adding or weigh the liquid that you're adding um, that's being diluted. And then you're going to fill this flask up in several portions. And with each portion, um, say maybe you fill it 80% full or so, about so, you're going to mix it. Um, and then as you get closer and closer to the line, then you're going to do the final drops to this line, and they always have a calibration mark there. And on here, you can see the calibration mark just there. You're always going to do those final drops with a dropper pipette. Um, the number of times I've seen somebody use a squirt bottle to try to add water to a volumetric flask, that neck is very narrow, a very small amount of solution will change the level a lot, and they'll shoot right past it. So use a dropper pipette, and always make sure you're thoroughly mixing. So invert it 20 times. Now, why don't you just fill it to the line in one good swoop? Um, the issue is that density might change when you're dissolving things. Also, you have um, some volume that's displaced, given that you have initially some solid or liquid in there. Um, and so you need to make sure that it's going to be per liter of solution there. The other thing is to pay attention to temperature. This glassware is calibrated, like I mentioned previously, to a certain temperature. And if your solution is hot or cold, it will not actually be the labeled volume. Pipettes, you have many different types. Um, for really small volumes, things that are less than a milliliter, you want to use a micropipette. These are adjustable and they work by air displacement. So you have a little disposable tip that goes on the end and that tip inside of it is going to suck the liquid up by having moved away a piston. And then you can eject it afterwards. Um, for glass pipettes, if you have an exact total volume that you want to deliver, your best option is the volumetric transfer pipette. Um, if you want 10 mils at that line right there, it is going to be exactly 10 mils. If you need a more unusual volume, then your more pipette or your graduated measuring pipette is what you want to use. But you have to be careful with those because most of them, not all, but most of them have a dead volume at the bottom. And so to do 10 mils on this, you fill it to here and then you're going to let it drain to that 10 mil mark. You don't want to drain that part because then it would be over 10 mils. Also with most pipettes, you're going to be dispensing the volume and there might be this final little droplet that's left in the very tip of it. And so you need to find out whether the particular one that you're using is one where you should blow that final drop out using the bulb and never your mouth, but with the bulb, um, or if it should remain in there. So three cautions for glassware use in general. Always make sure it's clean. If it's dirty, um, then your liquid might not drain out of it properly, or as you're shaking it, you'll get little drops behind, um, and that'll alter your volume. Make sure that when you're filling it or when you're pulling solution up, that you're right at the line, and make sure your eyes are even with that line so you don't get any kind of parallax or misreading. 
And also make sure that if you've recently cleaned it and it's not totally dry, that you rinse it out with the solution you're going to be using. Um, that'll re remove the residues of previous liquids that had been present. All glassware has error. Um, I pointed out earlier there was a 100 ml flask, plus or minus 0.03. Um, your typical volumetric flasks um, have classes. So there's class A, which is the absolute best for analytical. There's class B and other ones that are less um, perfect. And so I'm showing you these tables so that you can always come back to this and read off of here what your typical tolerance is for things. Your class A transfer pipettes also have this tolerance table here. And your micro pipettes, you should probably look at the actual manufacturer of yours, um, but you can see that they have um, an accuracy that is going to be proportional to the quantities that they're using. Um, adjustable volume ones usually are less accurate than the fixed volume. Um, so if you're doing, say, a 10 microliter fixed volume, and so that means it's always going to be doing it, it's plus or minus 0.8. Um, if you're doing 10 microliter adjustable, well, at 10%, which is your 10, then you're at 1.8. Okay, so um, accuracy is worse when it's adjustable. If you're going to do really accurate work, you need to calibrate your glassware, and that includes pipettes, whether it's plastic tips on a micro pipette or actually glassware. You do that by weighing the amount of water that's dispensed. If you're using distilled water, um, and you know it's temperature, so make sure you get the temperature. Then you can use the fact that water density depends on temperature to figure out, oh, okay, if I'm going to put a flask in there, which I'll call my receiving flask, so there's my little receiving flask, balance it out, tear it to zero, and then I'm going to add liquid, all right, I'm going to add it multiple times so that I can get some replicate measurements. That mass of water that's been added, I can calculate it using the density to figure out what the actual volume is. Um, if you have a burette or a more pipette, more pipette having the one with multiple lines, make sure you calibrate the different parts, so like top, middle, bottom, because that might actually be different as you go down. Um, here's your table of densities for water, um, ranging uh, from 10 to 30 degrees Celsius. And then lastly, I wanted to make a comment, a um, couple of comments here. And one of them is about dilutions. Um, if you're going to use a concentrated solution and dilute it down to make a dilution, make sure you're using your best, most precise glassware. Um, for example, pipettes, volumetric pipettes, and volumetric flasks. And then realize that if you're using the dilution equation, right, M1V1 equals M2V2, that you're using units where it's concentration per volume. Um, any of those are fine, as long as it's per volume, um, moles per liter, grams per mil, whatever. But you're going to have trouble if you're doing, say, weight percent um, and have weight on the bottom. The last thing is the lab notebook is probably your most long-term tool in the lab. Write down everything you do, everything you measure, everything you observe. This is your captain's log. I would want to know what did you do, why, and why you thought why. Um, so why was it significant? Other people should be able to reproduce your work um, from your lab notebook, and it should be able to answer questions about what was done. You might remember right now, but in a year when you go back to your lab notebook, and I know you might not think you're going to do that for class, um, but you might, particularly if you're doing research, you're going to go back and say, man, what was the concentration of the stock solution? I wrote down how much of it I used. I never wrote down the concentration of the stock solution. Make sure you have all of that. Um, and also, as you move forward in life, you might have the opportunity to work on things that are new and discoveries, uh, things that could be patented, and you'd want to have these well-kept legal documents of your lab notebook. All right, those are your basic tools. Bye.